without further ado, I'd like to introduce Randy Reppin. Thanks for joining me. I'm sorry that we can't all be together in Denver, but this is definitely a very nice option that Cambridge is providing for us to be together virtually and to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is grammar and helping students be successful. Those are two really important things. So the goals of the presentation today, I hope that we will accomplish these. I, I'm, I'm confident we will accomplish these. So today we're going to look at differences between formal and informal language, which I think is really an important thing for us as teachers to be aware of and some of the challenges that our students face as they navigate this change from their even high school lives to university or college lives. I want to really look at grammar across all skills. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I don't know, I teach reading, what does that matter? Or, you know, I teach speaking, we don't really need grammar. And I hope by the end of this presentation, you see that grammar is a skill and it's needed across all skills. I think none of us would think about teaching reading or conversation or writing or speaking without thinking about vocabulary. And if you have vocabulary, you need grammar because vocabulary gets put in order by grammar. So I think that hopefully by the end, you'll say, yeah, of course. And then I think it's really important to connect grammar through meaningful practice. And we'll look at that, I'll give lots of examples. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to weave aspects of how we can have meaningful instruction. across. All of my examples are gonna come from a series that just came out last year, Grammar and Beyond Essentials. Some of you might be familiar with Grammar and Beyond and wonder, well, what is Grammar and Beyond Essentials? And it's a updated version of Grammar and Beyond with an emphasis on the grammar. So the writing section has been taken out. There's still writing, but there's not the emphasis on writing that is present in Grammar and Beyond. And I'll also at the end show you some of the really cool stuff that, that is included with this, new, with this new version with Grammar and Beyond Essentials. So is grammar instruction important? And you might be thinking, well, of course, I know what she's going to say because this is a webinar on grammar instruction and it's Randy Reppin and she loves grammar. I actually came to love grammar later in life, but um, I, I always saw its importance. So is grammar instruction important? Yes, but it has to be meaningful. And it is essential for success. I think if we Think about first impressions when, when you see someone or when you meet someone, when they open their mouth, we, whether it's right or wrong, we have an impression of that person and grammar plays a part. Also, grammar instruction is important, but it also takes practice. And I think it takes practice for both we know it takes practice for students, but I think it takes practice for both teachers and students because teachers need to learn how to do effective grammar instruction and, and know how and when and why they're teaching what they're teaching. And I think that's really, really important. So I think it's something that as, um, as a teacher in a teacher training program and also as a language teacher, I know that it's a hard thing to always have grammar instruction be contextualized, but it's really important. It has to be contextualized. And the contextualization is what makes it meaningful. So we're going to be diving into this and asking and exploring how we can look at meaningful grammar instruction. You'll see here that I've put spoken versus written. These are dichotomies that we often make in our in our language classes of you know speech is different from writing. And I want to challenge that a bit and think about informal versus formal, which can even be a bigger issue because 
I'm, and I'm sure, well, if we were at TESOL and face-to-face, -face, I would ask you these questions and get responses. We're not going to do that right now. But when we think about written language, it's not always edited and revised in first and second drafts. When you make a grocery list, when you write a text message, when you write an email, often those are to friends or family or peers, and it's informal. And yet there's this formal aspect that I think is often hard for many of our learners who have gone from a very spoken culture and they think, okay, yeah, I'm pretty good at English. And then they come into the classroom and all of a sudden their spoken English isn't quite on target. And the reason is because they're used to using it in an informal context versus a formal context. So I wanna look at this for a little bit and I want us to think, what do we know about these distinctions and how do we know it? So I want you to take a second and think about what you know about informal, formal, spoken versus written. So many of you probably thought, oh yeah, you know, informal, we use more contractions, we don't speak in complete sentences, and written is often very formal and we wanna be very precise, and that's all right. How do we know that? We know that possibly from observation. If you're a native speaker, of the language that you're teaching. So in this case, I'm gonna be focusing on English. If you're a native speaker of English, you probably know it from your experience. You know that you have to change the way you speak or the way you write, depending on who your audience is. Whether you're talking to your boss, whether you're talking to a friend or talking to your child. So I wanna unpack that a little bit for us because many times we know things, but our grammar books or our textbooks in language, English language classes don't often reflect what we know from research and also from years and years of teaching. So when we think about speaking and writing, I'm sure all of you can think about, oh yeah, contractions. I, yeah, we don't use many contractions in, in formal writing. But what about words like who and whom and that? Well, we know for, from academic writing research that who is preferred over that to refer to people. And there's some people who actually present that as a rule. It's not a rule. You don't have to use who with a person, but there are some people who are prescriptivists rather than descriptivists. And so we know that you can use either one, but who is strongly preferred in academic writing while that as a relative pronoun is preferred in speech. Neither one of these are wrong or right. I'm just saying this is a tendency that we know from research that you might not have known intuitively. Some of you might have known the who preferred for people because you've been taught that as a rule. It's not a rule. But let's move forward to patterns in academic papers. Many of our students are going to have to write academic papers for their courses. And from research, we know that single word verbs are typically preferred over multi word verbs or idioms. So here are some examples from an exercise in, in Grammar and Beyond Essentials where we take words like find out and we say, let's choose discover or learn. And this isn't to say that these are the only words that can be used, but this is an example for students to see how we want to be teaching them the words and the vocabulary and the grammar that they'll be needing in their academic endeavors when they're writing. And so we could say look into, and an example for look into could be investigate, it could be explore. We can then build on this in later classes. But the idea is that we know these things from research, and this is really important that we help our students move towards this type of language use. So what I'd like to do now is take a specific grammar feature, like time clauses, and we're going to look at using this feature several skills. So I'm hoping that I can showcase 
through this one feature in a way that helps you see how you can incorporate all skills in a meaningful way. So as good teachers, we often do pre-reading activities. So here's an example of a pre-reading activity with time clauses. So we have, first we're engaging students, tapping into their background knowledge. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? We could talk about that with our students. It gets some schema activated. We get some, we get some vocabulary going. But then we say, we're going to read an article from a textbook. And looking at this direction line, you might think, huh, yeah, we're gonna read an article from a textbook. What I think is really nice here is we're telling the students where the article came from. It's not just read the passage below. We're saying this is from a textbook so that they know what they're reading. It also gives some credibility to it. And then the next question is, how is ice cream today different, ice, different from ice cream in the past? So already we're talking about time clauses. We're getting that, that notion of we're gonna be comparing past and present. So here's the article from the textbook, or the passage from the textbook. And as we look at this article, as we look at this textbook excerpt, we see that it's got some features that are bolded. When you look at that, you can see also that there, these features are not over-presented. So in the second paragraph and the last paragraph, there are no time clauses that we're trying to target for instruction. So this is a thing that sometimes happens in textbooks, in grammar textbooks particularly. Um, sometimes people pepper passages, how about that, pepper passages with the target feature. And in Grammar and Beyond and in Grammar and Beyond Essentials, we're really careful to have this be authentic presentation, meaningful, what students will encounter and not over-presented. The other thing I want you to notice is that in the fourth, yeah, the fourth paragraph, it starts with when an Italian duchess moved to France. There's a little number two there. Why is that number two there? Well, we know that's there because it's a footnote. And this is something students are going to encounter in their textbook reading. So in, in reading this passage, we have some things that we can point out to students that will help them in their future reading when they're in academic courses. So we've talked about pre-reading, we've talked about the reading, and now what could we do as a post-reading activity? We can have some meaningful interaction with the text. We can have students do a noticing activity. Those of you who know me know I'm very fond of guided noticing, not just hoping they notice something. So here we have students going in and looking at the texts and you can see that they're having to fill out a gap here. And you might be thinking, okay, well, this is you know just the plain old copy and paste thing. But the one thing it does reinforce is a reading strategy of scanning where the students are having to scan the reading text that we just looked at, where they have to find those passages and put that in. And we could stop there. And so we would have practiced a scanning skill, looking for these time clauses. But then we can also highlight the fact that we've got two events happening and one is happening before the other. So it's really nice that this gives us an opportunity to talk about the function, the purpose. Why do we have time clauses? Are they important? And so we've looked at reading, we've talked, we've interacted with the text, we've done a pre-reading activity, a reading activity, and a post-reading activity. So now let's think about conversation. Many of us in our grammar classes and in all of our classes, in our speaking classes, listening, maybe you're in an integrated skills program where classes are taught all together, and I think that's wonderful. But when we look at time clauses in conversation, what we know from research is that we don't usually answer with complete sentences. Yet many of us in our classes, in our language classes, are insisting, you know, if we were, when did you start studying English? We want our students to say, I started studying English when I was in high school. And so this is something that I think this is a time when we want our students to practice patterns of use. And in this case, when we're asked time questions, 
with when or what time or how long. We want students to answer just with a clause until I got my degree. So, or after I got my job as a museum at the museum. So I think this is an, an, an important takeaway from this that always answering in complete sentences is not natural. It's not a pattern of use when you step outside the classroom. The other thing I want to talk about is meaningful practice. So in this case, we're doing a listening activity. We're listening to a different type of spoken language, a little bit more formal. It's an interview. And in this case, I think this matching activity is, is a good scaffolding to doing to listening to an interview and getting information later on without all this scaffolding. But the one thing I want you to see is that you really can't do this matching activity unless you've listened to the dialogue. And here, this QR code allows you to listen to the dialogue. So that's a really nice um, listen to the inter interview. And then, of course, we have students listen again to check their answer. I also, I think, you know, known trouble. Those of us who've been teaching for a long time can anticipate some of those roadblocks that our students are going to face with time clauses or with any other grammar structure. And so here we have an example of some common mistakes. And we can see that these, you know, be sure to use a subject in the time clause, and then this problem with used and use. And you can also see again this little icon, and that clicks if you clicked on that of course not in this textbook it would take you to online practice so i think that this is really a good feature to point out things that could be problematic or challenges for our students but we could stop there but also we can have students practice editing so where they have to find the mistake and this is some a skill that i really really believe in it's really hard to edit our own writing it's much easier to as we're learning to be proficient writers, to practice this type of editing, to learn to look for mistakes. So this is an editing task that I think has great transfer later on and is really important to incorporate in our classes. So we've looked at listening, speaking, reading, writing, vocabulary, grammar, all through the lens of time clauses. So, Thinking about more ways for meaningful practice, I want to highlight some of the aspects of grammar and beyond essentials. Assessment, and you might be thinking, what? You're focusing on meaningful practice and you're, that's the death of meaningful practice. No, it's not. Notice there's the first thing there is the placement test. If you don't have your students in the right level, nothing's going to be meaningful. And the other thing is that here we have available unit tests, midterms, finals in different formats, so you can easily adapt them for your needs to make it meaningful for the context in which you're teaching. We have Presentation Plus, which is really super cool and able to project stuff in a classroom, but right now we're not in a classroom. We're all having to deal with distance. So I want to point out that we have an online workbook that gives automatically graded exercises and immediate feedback. Perhaps you're using some of these, maybe you're coupling Grammar and Beyond Essentials or another textbook that focuses on grammar with some of these. If you're using Grammar and Beyond Essentials, you can, or you can um, map the lessons with final draft for writing or prism reading or making connections. This, is, this work has been done for you. There's also this amazing Quiz Your English app, which is so fun. Your students will be interacting with classmates or people around the world. And this is great for this time of online learning right now. We can encourage students to practice in a fun way. And now with Grammar and Beyond and Grammar and Beyond Essentials, we have Kahoot. And if you haven't used Kahoot, I encourage you to take some of your stay at home or shelter in place time and go and check this out because it's such a fun thing. And the folks at Cambridge have made the material in Grammar and Beyond and Grammar and Beyond Essentials available. So you could use it in a classroom, if you were in a classroom, or online on a mobile device. So to wrap up, I hope you've seen the importance and the need for grammar instruction. 
some ways to connect grammar through meaningful practice, and that it's really important that activities are connected in a way that is across all skills and meaningful. And I'll leave you with this, um, these two books and the web pages, the websites for these books. The first website that links to Grammar and Beyond has a great newsletter. It's a free newsletter. It's published once a month, has lots of resources. Even if you're not using one of these two series, the resources would be really valuable for you, I believe. So I want to thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, and I'll leave you with this so that you can have the grammar, the links if you need them. All right, thank you so much, Randy, um, for that webinar, uh, for that session. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please take this time to put them in uh, the questions box in the control panel. Um, and while we wait for those questions to come in, I just want to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and a link to the recording along with a link to download your certificate of attendance will be emailed to you in about one to two weeks. And if you don't have any questions, that's okay too. We can yeah. definitely answer questions later. Or you can write me, my email is easy to find. All right, so we do have some questions coming in. Uh, the first one says, could you clarify a little bit how and why correcting mistakes in a text might be a meaningful activity? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. So one of the things when, when we produce written texts, we go back, we reread them carefully. If you reread them the same day you've written them, as many of our students do when the papers do the next day or that day, it's hard to see the mistakes. And by saying, I'm going to look for specific mistakes. So I'm going to focus just on maybe make sure I have the correct verbs that I'm using as many single word verbs instead of multi word verbs. So the sense of going through and editing a text for not necessarily errors, well, sometimes in the case of errors, but sometimes also for certain features and just having the students have a focused look through that text and then maybe do a couple passes. Maybe the first time they're looking to make sure that they have periods at the ends of their sentences, that their sentences are complete because in academic writing, we want complete sentences, unlike in conversation and responding to time clause questions. Um, also that way, students are learning that it is important not just to write your text and send it off, that you do need to reread it and edit it. So. I hope that answers your question. I, I think sometimes looking for errors can have a negative connotation, but I would say I think of it as focused editing. And the more we do that, the more practice we get with that, the easier it becomes. All right, thank you for that, Randy. Um, so, and there are people asking if you have any ideas for extra practice activities. Um, well, I think. And like uh, one in particular that says uh, focused on increasing grammar awareness among low proficiency learners who are learning remotely. Yeah, I think it's really hard with low proficiency learners learning remotely. I think it's hard with any of us learning remotely, but I think with low proficiency, uh, there's an added challenge. So I think um, gamify, gamification, that's a great word, isn't it? Um, we can make that more fun, which makes the practice more engaging. And then the challenge is to make sure that we have a reason that we're having them do these tasks. So as I mentioned, Kahoot is a good example of, way of ways to practice more. Um, quiz your English. And yesterday there was a session by uh, Bruce Mint on using Kahoot, and I believe that'll be recorded. Is that right, Kyoko? And then people could look at that to get additional ideas. And, and that's in, Co in both Kahoot and, and Quiz Your English, uh, Cambridge has leveled this. So the lower proficiency students could be using um, level one grammar and beyond, level one grammar and beyond essentials. If you're talking about really low proficiency, then I think Ventures has a lot of material that's available online and, and Kyoko and the people at Cambridge would be more familiar with that than I am. Yeah, so um, the Kahoot webinar um, that 
Randy just mentioned, has been recorded and we will be, the recording will be available online for you to view um, in about one to two weeks. So um, we can share that information as well. All right, next question. Do you have any suggestions for uh, students who make fossilized mistakes and how they can get over that? Yeah, the whole term fossilized, I was a geology major in college, so I always think of that as being pretty funny because fossils break pretty easily, um, but our fossilized error habits don't. I think the only thing is practice and just raising awareness and helping the student realize in what contexts that error matters. And, and so this may seem like a non-answer, but you know, in some cases, that error, it depends on what the error is. If, it, if it's an error that really impacts comprehension and impacts the chances for the student to succeed in an academic environment, then I think it's really important to talk to the student and have the student become aware of how that error impacts their language and their ability to communicate effectively in either writing or speech or both. And I think that's the only way to say, you know, look, this is something that really matters. Here's why it matters. Here's how it matters. Look at what your error does to meaning, and let's look at what fixing it does to meaning. And I think talking about language is really important. And I, I've had success with that approach, so I would encourage you to try it. But it does take time to relearn. It's like learning, you know, those of you who write with your right hand, if all of a sudden you had to write with your left hand, it takes practice. It's not an error, it's just relearning something and training muscles, training our mind. All right, thank you. Um, all right, let's see, it says, hello, Randy. I always ask my students to answer with complete answers. I tell them that in real life, people are more objective, but in a language class, they should use complete answers so as to get familiar with the language patterns. Do you think this could be harmful for my students? Well, it won't be harmful, but when they go out and they start answering time clause questions in particular with complete sentences, they will seem unnatural and then they will have to unlearn that pattern. So I think it's, I think it's good to point out that in a classroom in certain contexts, you would answer in complete sentences, but with time clauses, particularly, you don't want to. If someone says to you, what time is it? You don't say, the time is now 10 o'clock. You say, it's 10 or 10 o'clock. And so I think that it's good to practice the language that our students will be needing, out, will be using outside the classroom. So why make them learn and unlearn something when we could just learn it? All right. Let's see, next question. Do you think the flipped classroom model would work well um, uh, for students in grammar classes? Yeah, I think it could work well. I would, I would say in a beginning level, in a true sort of low beginner, it could be really hard. But I think going forward, it could be really useful. And I think that it's a way of really engaging so that people can, or students can, can be practicing some things at home and then come in and really use them. I think that, you know, that's part of what we do in a sense that uh, an integrated skills class does that. So I, I'm not advocating that grammar should be taught in isolation in a grammar class only. I think it has to be across all the skills. So if your program has a grammar class, that grammar needs to be reinforced in the reading, the listening, the speaking, the writing class. And, and if it's not taught ex in a specific class, if you don't have a grammar specific class, then I think it's really important that grammar doesn't get ignored in the other classes, but it, that it's highlighted and presented in context. So I think grammar is important, but it has to be contextualized and it has to be interwoven. Nobody goes around just conjugating verbs for the sake of conjugating verbs. All right, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about grammar being taught inductively or deductively, and if you have any opinions on whether one is better than the other or what you what your preference is. My preference is to do both because I think sometimes there are features and aspects of grammar that are very effectively taught inductively, and there are others that are best made overt and taught deductively. Where we've had students try to 
you know, we can have students engaged actively, but then there are times when we, it's okay to say, this is, this is the way this works and do overt activities that, that practice the structure. In other cases, I think guided noticing is a good example of an inductive approach and, and where we can have students like, why do you think this noun had an S added to it? Oh, there's more than one. You know, some of those things can be can be taught that way. But I think both aspects are important to include in our classrooms because some of our learners are better at pattern matching and grammar is just patterns. I mean, it's just identifying patterns and patterns of use. So I think both are important. So I, I prefer to use both. All right, thank you. That's a question that I hear often, inductive versus deductive, but um, yeah, yeah, I think I agree. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's great. Yeah, learners have to different both. references. You know, I mean, those people who do crossword puzzles, you know, sometimes those clues are kind of tricky and it's the same thing. And, you know, you're having to be inductive in the crossword puzzle and you've got more structure than sometimes we have in our classes for those things. So. <laughs> All right, um, let's see, we have someone asking, or a couple of people asking, if you have any suggestions and tips on correcting speaking mistakes. I think, I think there's a time to correct speaking mistakes. I mean, obviously in a classroom, that's part of our focus is to help our learners become as, as proficient as possible. But sometimes if it's, a, if it's a speaking error and it's in the middle of a, of a discussion, I think it's more important to focus on the meaning and, and respond to the student in spite of the mistake. And then afterwards, maybe say, you know, when, when, when you asked that question or when you gave that response, I have to work a little bit to figure out what you were saying, but I really wanted to hear what you were saying. And so I did the extra work, but not all listeners are going to be that supportive. And, and so here's a way that you could have done that. So I think there's a time to sometimes say, oh, do you mean blah, blah, blah? And then there are other times to go on with that discussion, especially at sort of an intermediate level to say, yes, I'm interested in the information, but it's also important how you convey that information. And so, you know, going back maybe and recasting that would be important, but not stopping the discussion if it's going in a meaningful way. Does that make sense? Does, he, does that answer your question? I hope so. Um, it made sense to me. I hope it answered the question, um, <laughs> whoever asked that one. Um, all right, so apart from spoken and written activities, our school is, asks us to formally present grammar rules to students as a requirement. Do you have any suggestions for doing that and making it meaningful? Sure, I think you can take, yeah, so, so a couple of my favorite activities is cutting up grammar charts and having students find them in their readings. And so, you know, if there's, maybe there's a lesson on past tense, you could have students look through texts that they've read in class already, if it's a reading class or if it's a grammar class, hopefully you have some written language and you can have them try to find those rules and talk about those rules. Um, I think that's, you know, presenting rules isn't, isn't bad. I mean, these textbooks have, you know, charts in them and rules, but, to stop there isn't good. So the idea of presenting the rule, but then, but then having it presented, taking that, taking that rule and translating it into a meaningful context. Why do you think this text had past tense? So if we went back to the reading in this, in this webinar, we could look at why were those time clauses there? How were they guiding the reader? How were they creating information flow and a context for, where information is presented. So I think that's that's what the thing is. It's fine to present rules, but you can't stop there. So integrating it into a meaningful practice or maybe having a text where things are kind of higgly jiggly and then saying, well, why was that hard to read? Oh, look, we have rules about word order. You know, you can do that even at a beginning level or, or many of us have used jigsaw activities or cut up sentences activities where where students place those, you know, that's all governed by rules and grammar, but it's a meaningful activity. Right, great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about the Quiz Your English app that Randy mentioned um, in her presentation. So they're free app, um, down, you can download it off, off the App Store or Google Play. 
Um, and there is content specific to Grammar and Beyond that's based on avoid common mistakes. Uh, but we, and I think there's a question about whether it can be used with other courses. Well, the Grammar and Beyond, as um, Randy also mentioned, it's kind of the grammar points are correlated to other academic English courses. So you can use that to reinforce grammar. And for the for those using other courses like Ventures, there are generic topics um, that's built into Quiz Your English. So you can practice vocabulary using that app. But there's no content that's specific to Ventures. But we do have Kahoot quizzes. Uh, I'm going to type it in the chat, but to see all the products that we have ready-made Kahoots for and to use um, the links to those um, particular questions, we'll, you can find on that page. Including for any of you, and beyond. For any of you who have used Kahoot and, and made the quizzes yourself, it's, it's great and it's wonderful that you can do that, but it's also nice, especially at this time when we're really having to deal with online delivery to have something that's pre-made and you can have your students go practice and it's it's fun. Yeah. And if you do check get a chance to check out the recording of the webinar we had on Kahoot yesterday, you can there's a feature called challenges. So Kahoot is usually um, associated with being a live game that you host like a game show, but you can set a challenge and then the students can access a quiz that's self-contained that they can do on their own time and it doesn't have to be a live session. So it's great for assigning homework or to make sure like they do it as review. Um, right, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I'm just trying to see if, um, look for one that hasn't been answered. So um, while I look for something, Randy, do you have any, um, any, do you want to share any experiences with having to, you know, teach online or have, you know, seeing or hearing about like teachers having to move to online teaching? Yeah, so, so I think one thing, if it's possible, I think in many cases our students are have, have gone home or, or are in different locations. And so having uh, some of your material be available asynchronous asynchronously, so not in the exact same time, since many of our students are dealing with different time zones, that's important. And then they can also be looking at it when they're most alert. I also think that um, if you can set up some times when students can come in through Zoom or some other video conferencing, I think it's really important in this time when we're, we are so isolated and fractured that there's a time when they can connect and have discussion. So maybe even taking um, your class and knowing where your students are and, and maybe having small group discussions on Zoom can be really motivating and also really comforting. And I think that that's a good thing to consider, especially right now, because we weren't planning on being online and yet here we are. Right, I think we, are, we can all agree with that. and. We all have our share of experiences um, doing online, you know, moving to online teaching and learning. Okay, um, all right, here's a question. Controlled practice grammar used to take up so much of my class. What do you think about removing controlled practice altogether and only focusing on reading and listening and dealing with emergent grammar issues? Well, I. I don't know how you were doing controlled practice, but I think scaffolding is important. So when we get a feature that's new or, or one that our students are struggling with, I think it's important to, to start out with some controlled practice, but move away from that. So I think, you know, knowing if, you know, seeing if your students pretty much control that feature or they have at least a nascent control of it, then I think it's really important to push the envelope and have them do more and more um, self self-practice, if you will, or, or contextualized meaningful practice. And so I think the thing with, um, I, I don't know how you could practice grammar without speaking, listening, reading, or writing. So the controlled practice can be sort of this drill and kill, and I think we want to move away from that. So I don't know if I really answered your question, 
but to me, control practice shouldn't take up the majority of your class time. So it should be, unless it, yeah, it shouldn't take up the majority of your class time. So moving, taking, say, information from charts and having them find it in readings or having students role play, like with modals, you can easily, you know, have students role play modals varying the uh, context of the interaction, who they're speaking to, and showing how the modals change in their use. Because grammar, like I said, it's it's functional and it's we use it to communicate. We don't just learn it to be in a highly restrictive environment. We have to learn how language varies depending on who we're speaking to and what our goals of the speaking activity or writing activity are. All right, thank you. I think um, we are coming to an end. So thank you very much, Randy, for that very informative session. We have some great comments about um, how useful all your um, the information was on this webinar. And there's a couple that says this has been my favorite session so far. So, <laughs> oh, well, thanks. And I just want to thank all of you who are out there. And I'm sorry we can't be together in Denver. Hopefully, next year we'll see you in Houston and um, or see you somewhere in between. And and hang in there. I know it's a tough time, and you know it's a tough time for all of us. So kindness, patience, and generosity, I think, should be guiding principles. <laughs> Yes, those are very important things. So just to remind everyone that the link to view the recording and to download your certificate of attendance will be emailed to you in about one to two weeks. We appreciate your patience while we get um, the, all the resources set up on our end. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. <laughs>